this to me is like the really fascinating material. We don't know what the answer is, but we're looking for patterns. I think we're looking at kind of a type of cosmic alchemy. The story slowly grew Still, a lot of people don't know that this technology actually exists. The possibilities here are pretty mind blowing. We can't just believe that it was the work of these lone troubled individuals. And like a conspiracy theorist would look at that and say, well, they, the, the Illuminati. Well, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, All right. You know, we're here with uh, Tim Swartz on Conspiranormal. Uh, he has a book out that uh, put out through, uh, it's a, through Tim's publisher, right? <laughs> yeah, that's Inter- right. <laughs> Interlight Global. Right, and, right. Inter- uh, Interlight Global Communications. We're going to be talking about something that we've talked about on this show before, but we haven't gotten into like too terrible much of detail on it. And that's Jeff the Talking Bond Goose. And uh, this uh, is an interesting case. But I kind of want to touch on some other of uh, the Poltergeist cases that uh, you talk about in this book. But uh, first of all, dude, we've never had you on the show. Welcome to Conspiracy Normal, by the way. Thank you. Um, and uh, I just want to kind of get you like your background and how like, you kind of got involved with all this kind of weird stuff the Fortiana or whatnot and kind of like how you started like your whole um, association with uh, the other Tim, Mr. Beckley. Well, you know, I was, uh, I was kind of drug kicking and screaming into the whole thing. Um, you know, uh, I, and I'm sure that if you've asked this question of other guests, a majority of them say, Oh, well, you know, I was a kid and always interested in weird stuff. Well, when I was a kid, <sighs> I was more interested in, say, like, oh, you know, basketball or or, um, car racing, you know, uh, uh, born and raised in Indiana. So, you know, the Indianapolis 500 was always, you know, my my main interest. Um, I I enjoyed, you know, like science, especially, say, like uh, astronomy and uh, and science fiction. You know, I did like, uh, say, like, you know, science fiction movies and and things like that. But... uh, it was about. I, I, it was in third grade. Uh, we used to have a thing that was put out by uh, the the Scholastic Books. It was a weekly newspaper, and I think it was called, you know, like the uh, uh, the Weekly Reader. And uh, it was an aggregate of uh, various uh, uh, headlines uh, from that uh, from the previous week. And you know, it would it'd be distributed free to you know all the classrooms. And uh, our teacher would give us an assignment. Uh, everybody would get like a, a headline uh, from this paper, and then we would have to uh, write an essay about it and then and then present it in front of the class. Well, one week, I got a headline about uh, flying saucers or UFOs. You know, and I'd never I, I don't I don't think I had really ever, paid much attention to something like that. So, you know, I mean, I probably did, uh, you know, like a, probably a pretty poor, you know, half-assed job uh, uh, with the essay and, and gave it in front of the class thinking that would be the end of it. Well, I got, then dubbed the flying saucer guy. I was I was the kid I was the kid who you know believed in Martians and you know and all that and all that other stuff, and uh, and and boy, let me tell you that was third grade and that hung over my head. I think for the rest you know up until high school, <laughs> I think. But what was interesting is that, um, you know, uh, kids would make fun of you when there is everybody else around, but then later they would come back and say, you know, I don't believe in this stuff, but... And then they'd proceed to tell me a story about how, uh, you know, they they were on vacation and saw, like, a UFO over their car or their, their house was haunted or, you know, they woke up one night and, you know, their dead Aunt Mildred was standing by the bed. I got all kinds of stories like that. And that's really what got, you know, that, what piqued my interest in this sort of thing. 
uh, was all these stories, all these fascinating stories from people who um, had no idea what was going on. Uh, they had, you know, and, and you know, especially, uh, you know, years ago when I was younger, uh, you know, there wasn't the uh, proliferation of, you know, reality television shows like Ghost Hunters and uh, Project Blue Book and, you know, things like that now. So a lot of people had no idea how to categorize these experiences in their head. You know, we all have kind of like this this card catalog or or you know like a computer filing system in our brains where all of our day-to-day -day activities are you know are stashed away and we know how to respond and react to them you driving down the street the light turns red you you know hopefully you stop <laughs> you know uh, but when it comes to uh, a circular thing flew down from the sky, landed in front of me, and uh, little gray eyes, little gray guys with uh, big black eyes came out and uh, took me to Mars. Where are you going to put that? You know, he, most people don't have those experiences all the time, so it's really hard to uh, uh, to store that somewhere in your brain. So a lot of people tend to a try to forget about it. B, think they're crazy and end up becoming an alcoholic or a drug uh, uh, you know, addict, or C, just throw themselves full force into it, and then all their friends and relatives think they're crazy. Yeah. So, you, but, you know, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you know, the, the, when you, uh, to go back to something you said there about when you would talk to people and they would say, uh, I don't believe in this, but there was this one time. That's that's a phenomenon that you see over and over again. In yes. the, I, the, it's, there's something weird and psychological about that, and that people put kind of like this barrier, but they're willing to accept the. Well, I had this weird thing happen, but I don't know what it means. Which maybe is a healthy attitude. I don't know, but um, it, it's an interesting phenomenon because I, I've 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 had that happen to me several times now since people mm -hmm. know that I'm kind of into all these weird kind of subjects and they'll say the exact same thing. Right. Like, I don't really believe that, but I saw a UFO one time and like, I've never seen a UFO. And I, <laughs> so. uh, well, you know, so many people, if they have a, a, an unusual experience, and I would say that probably 99.9% .9 of, of the population has had some kind of, of unusual experience in their life. You know, it may just be, uh, you know, a, a fairly common one where, you know, you think about, you're thinking about somebody that you haven't talked to in years and years and all of a sudden they call yeah. you on the phone or, you know, you, you pick up the newspaper and, and read their obituary, that sort of thing. Uh, but a lot of people will just kind of ignore it. You know, it's like, oh, that was interesting and then go on with their lives. Uh, depending on you know how how strange or or mind blowing uh, the situation actually is, you know uh, I've talked to a lot of people who have had say like UFO sightings where they were with a friend or or, or a group of friends uh, who who saw the same thing, and some people would just be fascinated by it and want to talk about it. Other people will just shut down and refuse to talk about it. And, you know, years later, if asked about it, they're like, oh, I don't remember anything like that happening. Uh, you know, that's uh, I run into that a lot with, with with people, especially, you know, like I said, multiple witnesses. Uh, I, I know that uh, I interviewed it was a, a, a brother and sister who had a, uh, a UFO encounter where, you know, I mean, it was just, you know, like a cut and paste situation. They were driving home one night, a uh, UFO flew out of the sky, landed in front of their car, uh, their car uh, died, and then the UFO, uh, you know, took off again. She was fascinated by it. The brother just absolutely refused to talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she would yeah. she'd try to she'd try to bring it up and discuss it with him, and he would just <laughs> shut her down. You know, so I mean, there you know, it's 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 a, like a fear mechanism, I suppose. It's almost like uh, people have a threshold to what they can handle, yeah. what they can't. Yeah. Right, right, and you know, if you can't, you know, if you can't deal with it, then you don't think about it, you don't discuss it. It didn't happen. You know, and uh, so, I mean, a lot of these people then who have come to me to tell me their stories, they're not interested 
and getting publicity. You know, they don't want me to write, you know, talk about them in, in, in a book or anything like that. They just want somebody to listen to them who isn't going to laugh at them, who isn't going to tell them that they're crazy or make fun of them. They just want someone to listen to them and acknowledge that they had this event and, you know, and not judge them. And so many people, you know, after they tell me their story, they'll walk away and you can see where it's like this weight has been lifted off their chest, you know, because, you know, I would say to them, yeah, you know, that's that's really interesting. There's been a lot of people who have, you know, ex had the very same kind of experience and no, you're not crazy. And sometimes that's all a person needs to hear. Yeah, that's true. You're, you're right about that. The... Um kind of like that validation that uh you know this happened to you and uh, the, the and that you know you're not crazy it happens to other people and weird stuff happens and yeah <laughs> that's yeah. it basically well you know and some people are kind of disappointed when i can't give them sure. you know a, a, a pat answer you know like a black or white answer that you know oh yeah this was definitely an extraterrestrial spaceship or you know or, or definitely your dead uncle roy you know coming to visit you and yeah. you know because a lot of people they they want that they want that yes no type of answer and face it with this kind of stuff that's that's not going to happen you know it's it's such a gray area all the way around and that's why i tell people i say you know um i i i can't give you a pat answer uh, even just believing in any concept one way or the other is a dangerous path because then it sets your mind in a direction that is going to close you off to something, you know, a new information that'll come to you in the future that, uh, uh, you know, you're not going to listen to because you believe, say, like, A, that all UFOs are nuts and bolts extraterrestrial spaceships. And then, you know, you're going to be closed down to any kind of, of you know, uh, new information that may come to you. Yeah. So, like, uh, uh, you get you and uh, also Mr. Beckley there, you, you guys are right up my alley as far as, like, the non-ETH explanation for UFOs. I mean, I, mean, I know that... Uh, Tim, he had a long associate with John Keel, and you mm -hmm. know it's hard to not be around that guy and to, to, to say that there's, there's something physical about this. Did you ever um, work, do any work for like MUFON or any like the organized UFO groups? Or are you just more like kind of a, just uh, your own studies? Yeah, you know, I I mostly have have just you know been on been on my own i've i've never really been you know the 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 type of guy that uh, you know wants to be part of an organization or you know or, or, or something like that now you know i have contributed you know uh, my investigations over the years to to various you know places you know like mufon or kufos or yeah. you know, places like that but you know most of the time because when people come to me, they know that I'm going to take down their information, but I'm not going to, uh, you know, like reveal names or things like that, which, you know, that really, that bugs a lot of these, you know, organizations because, you know, they want, they want names and ages and, and addresses and things like that, which is going to prevent a lot of people from talking mm -hmm. about their experiences. And, and, you know, even though I have have their names and stuff in my files. I I always I always promise them that that I'm not going to release them, which you know kind of invalidates my research to a lot of people because I don't offer up these names. But I don't care, you know. I'm not I'm not af after this kind of stuff uh, to. <sighs> You know, to make those kinds of presenta uh, presentations or, or, or validations. You know, I'm I'm more interested in you know the, the the human experience of what has happened to them because really, ultimately, that's all we have. You know, all we have is these reports from the people. You know, they uh, unless somebody actually will come to me, you know, towing a flying saucer or a ghost in a jar or something like that. Uh, which hasn't happened yet so far, you know, as far as I know, um, then all we have is these, 
you know, individuals and their reports and their experiences. So, you know, I'm, I'm very cautious about um, revealing uh, the names and, you know, uh, 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 associations with, with these kinds of reports. Sure. Well, let's get to this uh, talking mongoose. <laughs> <laughs> It's such it's such a funny thing the just the Jeff and the way Jeff is spelled you know G E F, but it, it's it, it it kind of is a serious case in many ways. I mean it it's to me reading through through it in this book, it re, it reminded me of a local case here. We're in Nashville, Tennessee, so oh, okay. you can imagine we're not too far from the you know the Bell Witch. I mean that's a big part of like Tennessee folklore. Right. You, know, you grow we grew up hearing about that over and over again and um especially around here in nashville i mean it's a big thing but there were some very there's a lot of similarities between that case and jeff and in, in mostly the way the similar it's similar is like the the vocals but um I, I found it interesting in the book that and we'll kind of we'll get to like kind of the outline of the case and what happened but just to throw this question out um could you consider Jeff a poltergeist? You know, that's, uh, um, uh, that's, that's a good question because uh, there are a lot of aspects to, um, what happened to the Irvings concerning Jeff that, that are very poltergeist like, um, you know, you had, the 12 year old daughter, which, you know, uh, a majority of the times, not all the times, but the majority of the times with a poltergeist case, you know, you will have a, uh, a, a, a teenage girl, uh, though, I mean, you know, there have been, you know, like uh, teenage boys involved as well. Um, you know, Jeff was fond of, uh, throwing things around, you know, rocks and, uh, uh, needles and, uh, and, and stealing stuff, making things disappear, banging on the wall, just, you know, all the, all the kind of things that, uh, are, are very similar to, to a poltergeist. But, um, I, I don't think that Jeff could be exactly categorized as a poltergeist. And that's, you know, that's something when we get to when a poltergeist, uh, starts to talk, it's, it's, it's very rare, first of all, you know, it was like, like the Bell Witch, you know, the Bell mm-hmm. Witch started out kind of like as a, uh, uh, a, a normal, <laughs> you know, you put quotation marks around normal, uh, type of, of poltergeist, but then quickly it escalated to, uh, something that, uh, uh, talked. And I'm not just saying, you know, a few words here or there. I mean, like Jeff, the Bell Witch was so, uh, verbose that, uh, you couldn't get it to shut up. Yeah, that's and, how they're very similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and there's been there's been a few other cases in history that that are very that are similar, uh, but but Jeff is so unique in other characteristics that um, it's it's really hard to categorize him. It's it's impossible to categorize him. And, and you know, I I know that a lot of researchers, uh, I mean, they they love to categorize things. You know, it's uh, you know column A, column B, column C. And if 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 whatever it is that they're investigating doesn't fit within those uh, very you know rigid parameters, then it's probably a hoax. And I think that's why Jeff uh, the has been somewhat ignored or just instantly uh, uh, debunked as as a hoax because you know he's just all over the place <laughs> and it's just it's it's really impossible to 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 say that yeah Jeff was you know like you know, a ghost or a poltergeist or you know a, a crashed alien from another planet which I never put that in, in my book by the way I'm just being I'm just being silly <laughs> uh, but. Uh, um, uh, it's just you know it, the case is just so unique so different that um you know it's it's just it's really impossible to say just exactly what was going on uh on the in that little uh, little farmhouse on the isle of man yeah that's true um 
he definitely was very talkative and mm. uh, one of the things i found interesting um was uh, I, I, looking at these parallels when I'm, I, there's another parallel that I'm, i want to pick up when we hit another kind of topic with the bell witch mm-hmm. but the at, there's a at some point i believe at the beginning of when everything is kind of getting started and ramping up and they it's at first they see like some like cat like kind of creature yeah um at 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 one point um and th- and this was fairly early on i mean but i mean jeff had already uh started to to vocalize and had described himself as being um a mongoose but uh um uh, Jim Irving, uh, who is the patriarch of the household, uh, both him and uh, and Vori, his his twelve year old daughter, saw a uh, a cat in their uh, in their farmyard, uh, one that they had never seen before. They described it as uh, fairly large, and it was uh, um, a, a tailless cat, a Manx cat, as as they're called. That uh, was just kind of like you know idly you know wandering uh, through the area. So uh, Jim got his uh, um, his rifle, and he wasn't uh, uh, you know he was hoping he wasn't going to have to to shoot it because he said that he liked cats and you know didn't like you know uh, shooting it. But he wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to go and try to you know get into the poultry or, or anything like that. But uh, him and Vori both uh, saw this thing just uh, 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 just vanish, just fade away and vanish. And hmm. then, uh, uh, and then later, uh, uh, Jeff piped up from behind the walls, saying, "That was me that you saw, Jim." And uh, uh, and and there was another case where um, a couple of of, of, of locals had uh, had come to visit the the Irvings and were sitting in their living room, and one of the men was petting something in his lap, though there wasn't anything in his lap, and when his you know the, when his friend was like you know what uh, what are you doing and he said well i'm petting i'm petting their cat and they're like there's no cat in your lap and this guy described that the, that a that a large cat had jumped up into his lap and snuggled down and he was petting it but then once he started you know talking to his friends about it he noticed that it had disappeared and uh, and again uh, later on jeff claimed that uh, that that was him and uh, again, that's that's one of the uh, the strange characteristics about Jeff, who, uh, you know, this thing claimed that it was a uh, a physical creature and not a ghost or anything like that. Yet it would do things like that. It could appear and disappear. It could change its shape, uh, uh, you know, uh, apparently, and, and do other types of, of paranormal types, you know, of, of phenomena, uh, which, you know, again, this is, you know, these are the types of things that really rile up a lot of, uh, of researchers about the case, uh, you know, because it's, it's, the, the 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 phenomena was just so wide ranging in the things that uh, that were going on in this farmhouse. You know, um, uh, like I said, you know, typical ghost haunting, you know, uh, uh, paranormal accounts. Uh, you know, and then things that uh, uh, seemed to be a bit, you know, more mundane uh, that. Uh, would seem to be coming from a physical type of creature of some kind, like uh, um, uh, Jeff was uh, um, would uh, would kill rabbits and uh, and bring them to the farmhouse uh, for you know for the Irvings to uh, to have have for dinner. I I can't remember right now, but I think it was like over uh, in in the years that uh, uh, Jim Irving recorded. All of Jeff's activities. I mean, he killed like I think it was over three hundred uh, yeah. uh, rabbits over over the years. Yeah, there's but, that uh, yeah. in the Harry Price book that's included inside this book, the mm-hmm. that chronology, which is very helpful to kind of get an understanding of the case. But it talks of you know every now and again it'll say Jeff August third or whatever. Jeff killed his sixtieth rabbit today, and you know like just like, just kind of stuff like that. And I, I found it interesting, too, that and the one thing that I, that I had never heard about the case was that 
I, I don't know. What is the plural of mongoose? Is it mongoose? I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> is it you mongoose? Know, that's that's it, been debated. It's, uh, <laughs> it, it Probably the proper way is just mongoose. Okay. Though though people, I mean, I guess that mongoose is also acceptable, but, yeah. you know, mongoose is probably the, the more proper term. <laughs> well, apparently at some point in the past, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but apparently someone had actually brought them to the isle of man yes and i believe they're what native to australia i think uh india india that's right yeah because they kill cobras yeah but india africa places like that too <laughs> but they um uh but yeah someone actually brought them to that island so there actually were i guess thought to be mongoose there mm-hmm the uh, uh, the the unusual thing about that is that uh, that Jeff had had claimed to the Irvings that he had been born in India, like in the 1850s, and had lived there for a while, but then had been uh, 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 captured with others and brought to the uh, to the island by a farmer who set them loose in order to uh, to uh, kill to kill rabbits which I guess at that time the rabbit population had, had kind of gotten out of control. Now, what, what is interesting is that um, later, after Jeff had made these claims, uh, uh, Jim Irving found out that that was true, that back uh, in uh, the, uh, the late, uh, I think it was in the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s, a local farmer had done just that, had, had bought a bunch of mongoose, from uh, India and and set them loose. So this was something that Jeff had claimed before there was any uh, you know uh, corroborating uh, information about it. Right. I mean that's yeah. See that that's interesting in and of itself is an is an outside knowledge. But we I mean so no one. I guess what is it two centuries later and I guess no one would seen had seen them on the island. Probably by, you know, it's it, it's it's hard it's hard to say. You mean yeah. you know after after the farmer had had released them? You mean you know? Yeah, whether there was like a population, maybe they. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah, that's just that I you know I don't think that, uh, and this is just you know I mean uh, I have never. Uh, read any uh, um, um, you know uh, stories to confirm that by the time the Irvings had moved to the island, that there was any uh, uh, mongoose still uh, left. Uh, I you know I don't know. Considering the climate of say places like you know India and other places that a mongoose lives, right. whether or True. not the Isle of Man, yeah. you know, because it's you know it's in the middle of the Irish Sea and probably you know the the climate is probably not the best during certain times of the year. So you know after a while, a mongoose under normal circumstances, you know, probably wouldn't survive. Well, there is that interesting picture that's in the back of the book that uh, Vori said that she took looks very mongoose like that's in this supposedly is jeff but the interesting thing about jeff uh, as i read was that when he would be seen he didn't look like your typical mongoose like he he had some weird features right right well and and you know i sh- i should say that that nobody with the exception of vori um really got ever got just a clear glimpse of him. The uh, both uh, uh, Jim Irving and and his wife Margaret uh, would catch glimpses of him every now and then. Especially, uh, he uh, he would run across the beams, um, you know, in the ceiling, uh, in in the, the living room, especially. But all they would catch would be like this kind of like this this small yellow furry thing that would just dash. You know, from from one place to the other, Vori got some uh, a, a, a few better glimpses of him. Especially, she claimed uh, when she was trying to get those pictures. Uh, the um, the the paranormal researcher Harry Price actually uh, sent them a, a camera uh, to do this, and uh, she took a number of, of, of photographs. Uh, under 
several different situations, and the ones that uh, that we printed in the book were considered the the best, though um, you know a lot of uh, a lot of skeptics naturally uh, think that they're hoax that you know they you know could have been like a stuffed toy or or maybe yeah. even even a rabbit pelt since jeff was so uh, so fond of killing rabbits that uh, that vori had faked it you know using you know a, 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 a rabbit pelts you know it's it's so much time has passed uh, that it's it's really hard to determine you know exactly you know what what was going on I mean we do know that um, there was fur samples Jeff allegedly had left behind you know samples of his fur to uh, to be sent to be to be analyzed but this fur turned out to be from their uh, from their dog Mona they had a sheep dog named Mona and uh, uh, they also, um, had like uh, um, uh, uh, a plastiline, you know, a clay uh, that that Jeff uh, w left like a teeth marks and paw prints uh, in them. But these paw prints, both his front and and back feet, were just so wild, wildly inconsistent with anything that we you know, currently know about any kind of animal that nobody could really say if they were actual animal prints or, or, or a hoax or, or what they were. Um, you know, it's, you, you had said earlier that, uh, some of the physical characteristics of, of Jeff were just really bizarre. Um, it, uh, he supposedly he was about, you know, like nine, 10 inches long, uh, with kind of like a long fluffy tail, uh, kind of a yellowish, uh, brownish yellow in color, but that he, instead of having regular paws like a mongoose would have, he had uh, uh, more like tiny hands with, with fingers on them. Um, and in fact, we we have a photograph in the book that shows uh, Jim Irving uh, pointing at a section of the wall to what looks to be like, you know, like little white, almost like doll like hands coming around the edge uh, of the uh, uh, of the paneling. And uh, uh, Jeff would use these hands allegedly to. Um, you know, he was able to open doors, you know, grasp the things. I mean, you know, they're almost like, you know, like monkey hands or something like that, prehensile. And uh, uh, and, and do a lot of the uh, things that, you know, supposedly a normal, you know, animal, uh, you know, un, un, uh, not a primate type of animal, but, you know, whatever a mongoose is, uh, you know, would not be able to do. Yet uh, you know, Jeff would use these hands uh, just to get into all kinds of mischief. Yeah, that that is interesting. It's almost like <laughs> such a weird world. Let me tell you. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, you know, so basically, you have, I think it's three. You you have Vori, who's the the girl, mm -hmm. and she, you said she was twelve when it started, and then, yes, uh, I think John was the name. I don't remember the wife's name. J uh, James, James Irving, and then his wife uh, okay. was Margaret. Okay, so it's basically three people. Um, yes, and they're kind of they're kind of isolated, and so there has been some speculation that this could have been a hoax. Well, is yeah, there, of course. Is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there any? Um, what's what's the what is? Does that hold up, or is it much more complicated? Well, again, it, it is. It's. I think it's a lot more a lot more complicated, and and I have to say that you know, thanks to Timothy Green Beckley, who was able to get a hold of the uh, uh, of Harry Price's uh, uh, book, The Haunting at Cashin's Gap which was uh, his investigation of, of the Jeff case. It was printed in 1936. It only sold about 400 copies, and then it just rapidly, you know, it just, it just disappeared. And the book has been out of print and, and really difficult to find all these years. Uh, Tim Beckley was able to find somebody who had a copy and uh, was able to... Uh, um, um, 
you know, get us the the interior, uh, you know, text and, and, and photographs. So, you know, we were able to learn a lot more about this case, you know, information that uh, hasn't been seen in in years. But, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess one of the main things that people accuse the Irvings of hoaxing was that Vori was a ventriloquist and was able to uh, to fake all this. Uh, and, you know, in fact, her uh, uh, kids that went to school with her said that uh, that she could throw her voice and make it sound like it was coming from, you know, like across the room or up a hill or, you know, coming from behind a door and things like that, which is just... Um, uh, <laughs> That's that's really in, impossible unless unless people were just really unobservant and and dumb, which I don't believe. You know, it people used to believe that a ventriloquist could throw their voice, that they had learned an ability to actually make their voice sound like that it was coming from from far away. You know, now we know it's 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 a a matter of distraction. You know, that's why a ventriloquist has a dummy. You know, because people are looking at the dummy and not paying yeah. attention, yeah. you know, to, you know, the, the, the way that the ventriloquist is, you know, holding his mouth or smiling or, you know, things like uh, like that. So, you know, when people are saying that that Vori was this, you know, genius ventriloquist, um, I think that there's this kind of like uh, grasping at straws for some kind of explanation. Vori herself now, uh, years later, when she was 52 in 1970, uh, a writer from Fate magazine actually tracked her down and, uh, and got her to talk to him. And, and she said, you know, she goes, look, if I had been that good of a ventriloquist, I would have, you know, in, in, instead of going and working for, you know, in a factory for the war effort, you know, I'd be on stage, you know, making a bunch of money as as a gifted ventriloquist yeah, because that's know, a real talent it is it is and uh, even if she was good enough to to fool people i seriously don't think that she could have fooled her parents for over 10 years that's how long this phenomenon lasted you know it started in 1931 and really it it went up into uh, around 19, you know, 40, 1941, uh, okay. by the time that, yeah, by the time that Vori so it lasted uh, longer. left home. It lasted it, after um, Price wrote the book, even. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. still it, going on, yeah. Yeah, and see, that's that's one of the unfortunate things, because uh, Price wrote his book in 1936. He, he received information from Jim up until around 1935. Uh, we, we've got, uh, there's a little bit more information that came from the, uh, uh, the, the paranormal investigator, uh, Dr. Nandor Fodor, who, uh, who went to and, and spent a week, uh, with the Irvings in 1936. But, uh, anything that happened after that point, we have no idea, you know, what, what went on. Um, you know, and in fact, there, there are a lot of, of, of frustrating gaps you know, in the information that that we have about this case, uh, you know, uh, we don't really have a lot of information from, say, like uh, Margaret, the uh, uh, Vori's mom and, and Jim's wife, uh, a viewpoint, even though Jeff seemed to be uh, very uh, fond of, of Margaret and talked to her uh, quite often. And in fact, Margaret uh, uh, claimed that uh, she managed to uh, to touch Jeff a couple of times and stroke his fur. And, uh, and and things like that. So um, you know, the idea that Vori managed all those years to hoax her parents with, you know, somehow, you know, uh, uh, throwing her voice or acting like a ventriloquist or, or doing all these things for that amount of time. Uh, it's just to me, that's that's just really ridiculous. I mean, um, I have a 12 year old daughter and you know if 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 she tried something like that you know i mean you know it's, it's you you would know it <laughs> and and the irvings i mean they did not uh, they did not just fall off the parent wagon you know when they had vori you know they were older i mean jim was 
uh, in his uh, uh, um, late late fifties when Vori was born and when all oh, this wow. was going on. He, yeah, he was already in his early sixties. They are they had already had uh, uh, two children before Vori that were adults and had you know moved away. Uh, you know, the, the, the Irvings had previously lived in uh, Liverpool in England and then kind of as a, uh, a, a form of retirement, uh, Jim had bought this farm on the Isle of Man, you know, thinking he was going to be a gentleman farmer and have the, you know, like uh, hired hands do all the work. And so by the time that they moved uh, uh, to Cashin's Gap, uh, their their two oldest children had already moved, you know, moved back to England and started having families of their own. So, um, you know, I I don't think that these these parents could have been that easily fooled if if Vori was was performing some kind of elaborate hoax all of these years. I mean, she would have been caught very very quickly. I'm I'm positive of it. <laughs> The ventriloquist explanation, uh, there's a parallel also to the infield case in that, too, because yes. they said that that was uh, pretty much ventriloquism. And the whole thing with uh, in the infield case of Janet making that voice, I've heard people just have just written that off, but I've heard that those recordings of her, and I do not see how that girl could have made that voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, some people have pointed out that uh, you know that that she was using, and I mean, and they did you know like uh, um, um, audio test to show uh, where that voice was coming from, and it was coming from what was called you know like the false vocal cords, yeah. which I guess are like folds in the uh, uh, the esophagus just above the the, the larynx, and that uh, uh, you know, most of the time. You know, if you talk like that for any extended period, you know, you're going to you're going to have a sore throat for quite a long time. If she was able to to do that, how was she able to do that, though? Because they went as far as to tape her mouth, you know, fill her mouth with water, tape it shut. Yet the voice still, you know, still talked. Um, there's uh, there's actually there's a video that's on YouTube now, you can find it, that uh, it was it was a, like a, a documentary film that was made at the time at the height of the haunting where they were talking to the two girls, Janet and her sister, and uh, the voice, you know, starts talking. And you can see Janet. I mean, she, she's smiling, but her mouth is closed. The voice is talking, and you can see, though, that... Um, her throat is moving as uh, as this voice is, is is coming coming out, but the way that it is talking, the way it is articulating, I think it would be it would be extremely difficult uh, for for anybody, even a trained ventriloquist, to pull that off for any extended period of time. Uh, which she was able to do, I guess the uh, you know the uh, the investigators you know they they had like you know three hours worth of recording at one point where this voice was just talking away, and uh, you know with uh, um, um, uh, with with Janet being the focal point of it, so I you know I speculated in the book that this could be a similar situation, you know with with Vori, if. Jeff was not, say, like um, an independent entity, um, or or you know, or if it was an independent entity, somehow it was using her to vocalize, um, and you know, I mean, it's uh, there were times when Vori wasn't around, yet Jeff persisted in 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 talking. You know, but, uh, you know, uh, again, the, the, you know, these are just speculations on my part and other researchers, you know, part, because, you know, like I said, this happened, you know, in the 1930s, all of the participants are dead now. So, you know, that's all we have. We just have the written reports. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we can't go and, and interview, you know, those that were involved with this. I, I think it is possible that... Vori, much like the girls in the infield case, that she may have faked some things, uh, 
because mm-hmm. it seems that in the infill case that the girls were they they really got they really got because that became a huge case and you had they they could put, were had a lot of profession a lot of pressure to perform for the cameras and i think maybe that could have happened with Vori too or maybe she made some things up that uh to just to kind of keep things to keep the case going almost like it's priming the pump and like the energy builds up and then something real then happens and i think it's it's very possible that in both those in in both instances the girls are really the prime focus for whatever this these entities were considering practically uh, every um investigated poltergeist case you know, there, there will be some attempt uh at uh, at hoaxing uh especially by the kids that are involved with this case you know it it, it wouldn't surprise me if Vori uh wasn't involved at some point or another uh, uh with, with hoaxing i mean just you know, just considering you know every other case you know that's happened but uh but to say that she was uh you know sorely re- responsible for everything that happened i think is really just uh you know just 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 trying to whitewash you know everything yeah. for for an easy right. explanation and and you know i mean that's uh you know it's like i said earlier you know people want easy explanations for things you know they want black and white you know you know yes this actually happened no it did not and i think that uh i you know i think it's kind of a little bit from column a and a little bit from column b you know i think that it it did actually happen but that uh you know vori probably um you know especially early on may may have hoaxed some things now you know she she, years later uh during that uh interview for fake magazine you know, she said that everything that that happened, that was reported on, that we talked about, actually happened. And but she said that she wished that it hadn't. She said that it just really ruined her life. Uh, she said that uh, she she really had to uh, uh, you know keep a very low profile uh, o- over the years uh, because of this. You know, she felt it was a stigma. You know, that, you know, how would people react if they found out that I was that girl, you know, who had the talking mongoose, you know, <laughs> yeah. in, you know in, in, in my house? Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, by the time she was 52, you would think that if, if she had been uh, pulling off this fantastic hoax all these years, that she would have said, yeah, you know, it was just, you know, I was just having fun with my mom and dad, yeah. and they just, you know, they just took took it way too seriously. You know, in, in fact, she said that, she said, you know, if if her mother and uh, Margaret and herself had it her way, their way, that they would never have told anybody about what was going on in their house. It was their father, Jim, who became really fascinated, naturally, with what was going on and then brought people in to try to figure out, you know, just, just what exactly uh, was happening. You know, they said that, you know, because of the reaction from other people that, uh, that lived on the Island, um, you know, they, uh, and, you know, her, her friends and classmates and things like that, you know, teased her, Oh, just horribly. You know, they called her the Dolby spook or the spook, yeah, I mean, you know how kids are. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and and she says that she just wishes that it had never happened. She said, but unfortunately, it did. And, and the same with the infield. I mean, those those. I mean, at least I think Janet has come out and she's pretty much said the same kind of thing that Vori said. Mm-hmm. That uh, you know, the well, I think first of all, they like you know, we really don't want anything to do with it, and you know, second of all, it happened, and. Uh, you know they it's been that's been over 40 years now and they've have no one neither of them have come out and said that it was oaks so right yeah yeah so something now, and, happened there too well and that's just it see i mean you know we've had other cases where you know of of, of poltergeist events where then the you know the kids involved will come you know when they our adults will say that you know yeah my brother and i were just you know <laughs> we were just 
just having a lark, you know, having having fun. You know, most of these cases were, you know, like uh, kind of like minor cases without some of the the, the really um, um, extraordinary types of uh, phenomena taking place. You know, it seems like the cases where really all hell has broken loose. And, you know, the laws of physics just seem to be, you know, uh, cast out the window. You know, those are the ones that, you know, years later, uh, when the when the participants are adults, they'll say that, yeah, this this actually happened and I have no idea why it did. Yeah. And there was a case um, around the same time as Jeff that was the um, the voice from the stove. And I had never heard of this. This apparently happened in Spain. Yeah, yeah, it happened. It happened in Spain, and uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name of the town. <laughs> I'll just, uh, I'll just, mang- I'll just mangle it. But, uh, but, I probably but, would yeah, too, so don't feel yeah, bad. yeah, yeah. And this is this is a this is another one. Now, the the, the odd thing about this one is that uh, there there really wasn't any kind of uh, associated uh, uh, haunting or poltergeist activity, uh, because the majority of the time when you have situations like this, they it usually starts out like a like a low level poltergeist. You know, you'll have you know like raps on the walls, and you know things will get uh, furniture will move around. Uh, you know, things will disappear, uh, and you know, and then maybe if it you know if it continues to escalate, you know, you'll start seeing you know like uh, 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 you know, like shadows or or brief glimpses of of, of of phantom types of apparitions and then you know then the voice uh, or writings writing on the wall and then voices and and, and things like that this case uh, it just started right away with a voice where uh, the the maid of the household was uh, 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 had finished uh, preparing uh, dinner that night was cleaning up and uh, the the voice started coming from the uh, the the chimney of the the kitchen stove uh, now this was in a, an apartment block and the stove was actually the chimney actually was shared by a couple of other uh, uh, apartments but um as time went by and the authorities got interested in this case, they actually went and moved everybody out of this uh, of this building, uh, including the family in the uh, the, the the haunted uh, apartment. Yet the voice persisted; it it, it continued to uh, uh, be heard. You know, not only at this point from uh, from the chimney, but from other locations, you know, uh, uh, around the apartment. And, uh, um, you know, much like the, the Jeff case, uh, this didn't last nearly as long, uh, it just, uh, you know, kind of just slowly faded away, which, uh, you know, that's, uh, that happens, you know, the, I, I think the majority of the time when it comes to these kinds of hauntings, you know, they'll, uh, they're, they just go full out for, for an extended period of time and then just slowly lose their energy and, uh, and disappear. Um, you know, Jeff being the, um, kind of the, um, uh, the, the difference uh, between that because he lasted uh, so long. But, uh, you know, uh, Vori said uh, years later in that interview that uh, that Jeff would, he would always um, disappear for a couple of days at a time. You know, he claimed that he was traveling around the island, you know, visiting, you know, neighbors or the uh-huh. bus station in the nearby towns. And then he would come back and gossip. You know, he would tell Bill the Witch Irving. Did that too, right? Yeah, exactly. She would do the same yeah. Kind of oh, thing. oh my yep. God. She and she and uh, Jeff. You know, it was the same way with Jeff. You know, uh, uh, he would reveal neighbors' uh, innermost secrets, uh, which did not endear the Irvings to the you know to the to the other. Much like the Bell, you know, much like the Bell Witch. Yeah. Um, there's a very but, uh, trickster-like quality to these. Very things. much, yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, but but Vori said that uh, uh, as time went on, uh, Jeff would be gone longer and longer to the point where he just uh, he just never came back. Now, when Vori was old enough to um, to move out, she she moved to. Uh, uh, 
to England and started working uh, as a machinist uh, for the war effort because, you know, World War II was uh, uh, just, uh, um, you know, really on the threshold for, for England. After she left, uh, Jeff uh, stopped talking, but there, there persisted um, – some of the activity that that he was associated with, you know, uh, moving furniture, knocks on the wall, you know, the sounds of of scrabbling, uh, uh, you know, in between the, the the stone wall of the house and then the, and, and the paneling, things things like that. But he lost his voice, um, and you know, and, well, and you know, you said that there was a there tricksters yeah. type of of uh, uh, you know. Uh, place with with jeff and um which has you know and i'm not the only one uh you know i mean there's there seems to be you know the possibility that uh you know that we could be dealing with you know like a um, an elemental type of of spirit you know the the isle of man has a very rich mythology when it comes to you know what we would call you know fairies and brownies and you know the 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 little little people and and Jeff sounds very much like um, what would be what have been called like a house spirit or you know the uh, the uh, uh, the spirit of the hearth. Uh, which you know was uh, wasn't like an elemental that guarded the house. You know, took care of the inhabitants. You know, made sure that the farm animals were uh, were taken care of. But uh, you know, you would have to feed it, uh, which you know the Irvings did with Jeff. I mean, he was fond of like chocolates and biscuits and you know junk food like that. You know, much like the uh, uh, the old uh, myths of the. Uh, uh, house spirits, you know, you'd have to, you know, keep them fed and keep them happy. You know, happy. They were also very quick to to anger. Same way with Jeff. You know, Jeff had a very um, sharp tongue. He would curse like a sailor uh, a lot of times. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, and and you know, if you if you went and you know honked him off. Um, you know, he would just, he would fly into rages. He would break stuff. You know, uh, he just, you know, was just uh, really, you know, and, you know, at first when Jeff made his appearance in the Irving household, you know, they, naturally the first thing that they thought of was that they were being haunted. You know, they called him a ghost and, uh, uh they moved Vori from her bedroom uh, in, into the parents' room, and which really outraged Jeff. I mean, you know, he he would scream incessantly and and uh, 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 break things and say, you know, and told him that you know, no matter where you hide her, I'll find her. And I mean, they they were just terrified at first, but he was uh, attached to her. Yes, yeah. yes, at first, at first, um, uh, but um, you know, after a while, they, you know, he calmed down and they kind of grew to accept him. I don't know, with the exception of Jim. I mean, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tim Beckley. You know, he said that uh, that they they almost treated him like a house pet, and I'm not quite sure if they went that far with him because it's still I mean you know you think about it you know you got something you know in your walls that's talking to you in this high high pitched squeaky voice I was going to ask you what the voice actually sounded like well, they, the, the descriptions, and again, you know, remember, the Irvings were not the only ones that heard this voice. There were other people, other visitors who heard this voice as well. They, you know, it was described as being, you know, high-pitched, squeaky, uh, sometimes difficult to understand. You know, I, I kind of think of like, almost like uh, uh, a high, higher-pitched version of Alvin and the Chipmunks, you know, ty- type of thing. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, yeah, think about it. I mean, you know, you got something like that. Uh, uh, vocalizing from your walls and ceilings, you know, I mean, you're not going to, I don't, I don't care how long it's been around. You're not going to treat it like a pet. You know, you're always going to be like, you know, where's, where is it now? Is it looking at me? (laughs) You know? And apparently, apparently he, he did because they couldn't get away with anything. So they were never just like people come over and they hear that high squeak, horrible voice. And they would say, no one would say that they wouldn't look at him and say, "Oh, that's just Jeff. Don't worry about it. It's it's all good." 
Well, I mean, you know, Jim did get to the point where, you know, like, you know, he wanted people to come over and, and, you know, and because he was trying to prove, you know, because naturally, I mean, you know, his reputation at this point was, was pretty, pretty bad. You know, the, there's, there's the crazy guy who says that there's a talking mongoose in his house. So if he could get people to come over and actually hear it, then, you know, he was, he was pretty, you know, he was pretty happy, uh, but he was also uh, uh, frustrated because some of the, you know, like leading uh, paranormal investigators of the day, when they would come over, Jeff would refuse to speak. And, uh, and, and in fact, you know, he would warn the Irvings that, well, you know, like say Harry Price, when Harry Price actually made the journey, uh, to come to the Island, you know, Jeff, Jeff warned them. He says, you know, this, this guy's a doubter, you know, he's, he's going to come and, and try to debunk me. So I'm just not, I'm not, I'm not going to perform. I'm not going to talk. And sure enough, he wouldn't. And then as soon as these people would leave, then Jeff would, you know, like, hey, I'm back and start talking again, you know, which then the Irvings would get mad at him, especially Margaret, you know, because you know, she was, while Jim was a lot more forgiving uh, about Jeff's antics, you know, the mom, the matriarch of the household, she was less so. She was just like, you know, well, if, you know, if you're not going to help us, then just get the hell out, just leave. And then, you know, Jeff would, you know, beg her to forgive him, you know, and that he was sorry. But then the next time, you know, somebody would come over, um, most of the time Jeff would refuse to uh, to perform. Um, there uh, there was one, one gentleman, a Captain McDonald, uh, that um, Harry Price sent over early on. Uh, uh, to uh, to visit the Irvings uh, because Price you know, wasn't able to make the journey, and uh, at, at first Jeff refused to talk or, or perform, so to speak, uh, for Captain McDonald. But then eventually um, uh, uh, he he grew to trust McDonald and, and actually did. I mean, McDonald reported that you know you know he he heard the voice, he saw some of the you know poltergeist like activity that Jeff would perform. And and he became convinced that uh, you know that that something something real was happening. He couldn't explain what it was. He didn't think that it was an actual you know physical talking mongoose you know living in the walls. But you know he couldn't say just exactly what was going on. Some explanations for Jeff, other than the hoax explanation. Um, here's a word that gets thrown about a lot, especially now in kind of the paranormal circles and that's the uh tulpa concept jeff as a tulpa mm -hmm. well um you know a, a, a tulpa or or thought form is is kind of a a modern world and and, and i was surprised when i you know i was doing research uh, for this book that you know i guess there's a whole online community of of people who are working to create their own thought forms, which is um, kind of like an independent personality from your own using, um, you know, like uh, psychic abilities, paranormal abilities, you know, what, you know, what have you. Um, uh, some people say that they are actually able to eventually create a physical entity uh, thought form or, 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 or tulpa with, uh, you know, just their mind, you, you know, for, for, you know, like meditation and, uh, and, you know, forming the image in your mind and that sort of thing. You know, others say that it's more of almost like an imaginary friend, uh, that, uh, or, you know, or maybe like a split personality almost, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, you've, you've created a, 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 a another entity within yourself uh, so uh, uh, the uh, like the um, Tibetan idea of a tulpa would be more of a, a a physical thing you know something that was created uh, uh, using uh, mental abilities and uh, so you know it has been kicked around that uh, that Jeff could have been a a, a type of, of, of tulpa. Uh, not just from Vori, uh, but from maybe all three of the inhabitants of the household uh, unconsciously participating in, um, 
giving uh, not only life but personality uh, 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 to this entity. You know, that's uh, uh, Dr. Nandor Fordor, who was a student of uh, Sigmund Freud and who approached a lot of this type of phenomena with a, uh, a psychoanalytical uh, a view. Uh, that was, you know, he kind of uh, uh, speculated that uh, that this may have been what was going on in the Irving household because, you know, you have these inhabitants who, uh, you know, at one time they, you know, they lived in England, they were upper middle class, they they were living fairly well, uh, very intelligent, well schooled, uh, uh, got around a lot, and and now they're living in this isolated farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. Uh, no electricity, no running water, no radio or telephone. And, you know, this is the 1930s. I mean, you know, a lot of places, you know, had had these things. Uh, but this household didn't. And that possibly, uh, you know, because of the, you know, the, 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 the psychological uh, uh, conditions that were going on in this household, that um, uh, somehow this you know independent entity was formed uh from their combined uh you know i don't know uh, uh, pain maybe psychological pain want you know what you know loneliness what you know what have you um uh, again you know it's it, it's kind of you know we can speculate endlessly we just uh, you know we we really don't know i mean that that explanation could be you know as good as you know as any um i i think that um that jeff was probably you know and this is just my own you know viewpoint was was probably a personality all of his own before the Irvings got there, yeah. but that they supplied, you know, they, they supplied energy and, and probably, you know, uh, aspects of their own personality, uh, because a lot of the things that Jeff purported to like, uh, were also the same things that the Irvings liked, uh, Vori, especially, you know, Jeff was interested in, uh, in cars, uh, uh, he, he claimed that he, you know, he liked to go to the nearby airport and watch the airplanes, you know, which was something that Vori liked to do as well. Uh, there, there were some, some very obvious, uh, similarities, uh, between Jeff's personalities and the personalities in the household. But, uh, I think he was more than just some kind of, you know, psychological, uh, offshoot of, of their combined personalities. Uh, I think that's a very, yeah, I think it's like you go into this and I think this brings me to the next question that I really wanted to, I really wanted to hit with you. Uh, very interesting concept. And this, it, it's almost as if this personality is there, this entity is there, and then it begins to get, gain energy from the people that are around it. And then it also fills in its personality around those people. And so this idea that you have that you talk about in the book is like almost like a poultry geist as a, as an artificial intelligence. This is interesting. Yeah. Uh, um, well, and this, you know, this came about from my earlier research in uh, the Bell Witch case. Uh, because there was a, a a remote viewer actually who was looking into uh, the Bell Witch and and they got the impression that um, that this was something that had been buried nearby on the farm that uh, that John Bell may have um, uncovered at some point. Uh, they got the impression of like a box or something like that that had this um, this entity locked away inside of it and that this entity was incredibly old and had been deliberately locked away. But they got the impression that this was something that wasn't it wasn't like a a human uh, 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 entity and that it somehow it was involved with a an older civilization 
and that John had accidentally unleashed it, let it go, you know, when he when he uncovered this box. Um, so go ahead. Go ahead. Is, what what I have read, and what's interesting that you say that is that um, it the haunting began to stir up after two of the sons of John Bell dug into an Indian mound. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we've been looking into uh, Sir Fiel more than I, but he's been looking into a lot of like our, our local area around here. There were a ton of Indian mounds, mm. probably where you're at too. There's a, there were a oh, yeah. few as well. I mean, you know, Cahokia is probably not too far from you, but uh, well, I live in so I live in southern Indiana. Okay. And uh, so and you're yeah, not that far from us, really. Right, right. Uh, uh, so yeah, there there are a lot of, uh, um, of uh, you know old uh, um, Adena and and other Indian mounds here. In fact, you know around here there were a lot of supposedly you know like uh, giants, uh, giant bones that were uncovered back in the 19th uh, uh, century. But uh, you know apparently whatever this was that uh, was perceived by this remote. Uh, remote viewing uh, session was a lot older, though, than uh, say any of the Native Americans that had had been here uh, uh, previously. So, I mean, this this was a, this was a concept that I kind of you know took and, and and ran with a little bit because you know when it comes to um, talking poltergeist, uh, uh, you know, the Bell Witch, Jeff, some of these others, they, they're, they're so unique when it comes, uh, w when compared to, to other poltergeist case, there's so much energy that, uh, involved with these things that, you know, it to me, it seems unlikely that uh, you know, a human host could be uh, uh, providing uh, 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 you know this this amount of energy without just being you know uh, running completely dry in you know a few days and and that's it. You know the the, the talking poltergeist. I mean, uh, it uh, they they persist a lot longer than than normal cases. They, uh, you know, not only do they talk, there's, uh, you know, like I said before, there's a lot, there's writing, there's uh, a physical activity, uh, there's uh, a porch, you know, the, the Bell Witch was especially fond of, of bringing, say, like uh, tropical fruits uh, to who was it Betsy uh, yeah. Betsy mm -hmm. Bell yep. uh, and, and 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 things like that you know she was also well known for you know physically striking uh, uh, people uh, John especially so you know I've I, I, I just you know I, I started wondering whether or not some of these cases, could involve some kind of maybe you know like uh, artificially created um, spirit you know for for want of a better term you know artificially created intelligence but not contained within say like a machine you know when we think of AI we think of you know like a you know, like a computer or a robot or a machine or something like that you know I I believe that eventually we're going to come to a point where we're going to be able to create uh, artificial intelligence that doesn't have physical boundaries that uh, for all intents and purposes would be like a like a spirit or a ghost or, or what have you you know what uh, you know what if at you know sometime in the past uh, there there was you know like another civilization that lived on this planet before you know before humanity I mean you know, when we were still you know maybe you know uh, uh, falling out of trees and thing and things like that that had this uh, had this technology and and created these types of things for whatever purpose you know I, I speculated you know these these could be you know like uh, companions uh, for children teachers things like that because one of the things you know the bell witch again is a good example you know Jeff is a good example too these things are very intelligent you know they they seem to have an almost encyclopedia type of knowledge of everything you know the bell witch could quote bible verses could quote from books that you know nobody else in the bell you know household knew what the heck that they were talking about 
So, you know, if if these things are some kind of artificial intelligence that, uh, uh, you know, I, you know, who knows? Maybe they you know, kind of like how the computer from two thousand one Space Odyssey. You know, maybe some of them, you know, kind of cracked up a little bit and they had to be, you know, contained, you know, and buried. And every once in a while, somebody will accidentally dig them up, and then all hell broke loose. You know. So I mean, you know, it's uh, again, you know, it's just it, it's kind of like a uh, uh, a thought project. You know, it's 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 you know, there's no there's no proof one way or the other, but it's you know, it's interesting to uh, to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that is fascinating. This like this this whole idea that you could have something that is completely independent. Um, interesting thought about how. This could be something that was designed to entertain some other civilization's children. And, and it almost seems like there's a, co- a computer program aspect to it. Like maybe after a while it just gets corrupted. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. It's an interesting idea. I I, uh, I, I read well, that and I was like, wow, I got to ask him about this because... Well, and the you know the the other aspect is you know with a lot of these talking poltergeists uh, uh, is that they are they're they're kind of unhinged <laughs> you know uh, right. uh, again, again the bell witch is, is is a great example I mean uh, if if you had an ant or so you know, or somebody like that who acted that way. You know, you you you'd have her hauled off to the you know to the institution, uh, uh, because I mean this uh, um, you know the 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 Bell Witch and you know Jeff again the same way in some of these other cases, you know I mean a lot of the stuff that they said and did were just really just you know that crazy. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, if you have, say, like a uh, um, an artificial intelligence that has, you know, blown a gasket, so to speak, but you can't go, there's no way to um, to get rid of them. You can't you can't kill them. Uh, you know, the best you could do is maybe contain them, you know, somehow, you know, and uh, uh, drop them in the ocean, bury them in a mound or things like that and, and be done with them. Yet uh, they, they still persist and if unleashed are able then to draw um, um, energy from humans uh, uh, maybe some from the natural environment, but but definitely I think uh, there is this human aspect that these things need that they gravitate towards, uh, you know, uh, probably as as an energy source, and uh, you know then they are able to uh, um, uh, you know to go about their business for you know uh, an extended period of time. You know, none of them seem to be. A uh, 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 permanent, you know, the Bell Witch lasted for quite a while. Jeff lasted for quite a while, but those re- those two um, are are really the 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 extreme on the extreme end of the uh, of the spectrum. You know, some of these other cases that I that I discuss are pretty short lived. You know, they'll they go full force for a while and then they just, you know, they either just fade away or they go out with a bang, sometimes a big bang. <laughs> well, one of the things that, uh, you know, the we talk about the Indian mounds here uh, and that, that possible connection to the Bell Witch, but also there with Jeff the Talking Mongoose, aren't there a lot of mounds and such in, on the Isle of Man that date back for centuries? Oh yes, yes. Well, and especially uh, in the area where um, the Irving's farm uh, was, uh, um, Cashin's Gap, uh, there, you know, was a apparent, you know, like uh, um, megalithic types of structures that yeah. had been ta- taken down, you know, by the local farmers over the years. So now all you had was just, you know, uh, um, depressions in the earth, or maybe there are some, some rocks or things still uh, uh, remaining. You know, and that's that's the other uh, aspect of uh, the Irving's uh, farmhouse is that uh, it was claimed that the house had been built in the probably the middle 19th century, uh, but 
there are some indications that the house was may have been a lot older than that, maybe even as far back as as uh, medieval times, hmm. uh, because uh, first of all, it was larger, even though it wasn't that big. It was still larger than most of the other uh, uh, farmhouses in the area. It, it actually had two stories. You know, the uh, the bedrooms were upstairs, then the rest of the house uh, w- was downstairs, which was uh, you know very different uh, uh, from from the other houses in the area. You know, the only houses that were built like that belonged to people who were pretty well off, or um, uh, considering how old that that house was, you know, possibly somebody who had some kind of, you know, like uh, a, a local nobility uh, type of, uh, of situation. Well, very interesting stuff, Tim. I mean, this this has been fascinating, and uh, we're going to have to do a whole other show, I think, about the Shaver mystery stuff. <laughs> I know that's a big thing for you. <laughs> So, oh yeah, now that's that's always a favorite. Yeah, the was it the Deros and the I forgot the, 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 the that's all that's uh we we just did uh not too long ago an interview with uh Adam Goriley and Greg Bishop on their UFO contactees book and uh oh Shaver is actually book. in that book so but uh, we'll have to get the get you back on to talk about that but uh, as far as the book on Jeff the Talking Mongoose where can people uh, get get that book. Well, um, naturally, like like any other book nowadays, you can uh, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, you can buy it directly uh, uh, from the publisher, Timothy Green Beckley. Just uh, uh, go to our website, uh, conspiracyjournal.com, and uh, there'll be links there that'll direct you to uh, to our bookstore. And uh, you can you can get a little bit you can get it a little bit cheaper from our bookstore, but we get more of the royalties if you buy it from our bookstore than you do with Amazon. But either way, you know, uh, Amazon, our bookstore, you know, buy the book because it's it's a fascinating case. If you've never heard about it before, then, you know, your mind will be blown uh, uh, once you dig into it. Yeah, absolutely. Just uh, the eighth wonder of the world, Jeff the Talking Mongoose. Well, thank you, sir. Um, we'll stay, we're going to close this section out, uh, but stay on the line for us, and we'll be right back on Conspire Normal. The elements shall melt. The elements shall melt. And we're back. Yes. Serfiel speaks. <laughs> yes. I think we had a little bit of a... We'll, we'll address it We'll address it here. But I think we had a little bit of a technical issues. We got some uh, some janky mic cables or something yeah. going on here. So. Yeah, hopefully I can uh, fix it in the mix, as they say. Yeah, you were, you were kind of like frantically trying to figure everything out while the interview was going on. That's why nobody got to hear you during the interview the interview part. Like yeah. I even said, you got any thoughts on that? Like, oh, Mike's not working, <laughs> man. I don't, I don't know. But, you know, I mean, that's how these things go. It's a podcast, and uh, we don't have a major studio around us. So just that's just how it happens. Hum- and we humble are in studio a, B. We are in a basement, um, and we're at Rob's. We're in a garage, so albeit a detached garage that we call a studio, but it, but it it is what it is. So, yeah, the the Buddhists say that unattached is better than detached. <laughs> That's deep, man. Is that like a cake co- koan or something like that? <laughs> um. All right. So since you heard the whole interview, um. Didn't really get a chance to talk. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I'm somewhat familiar with the story. Um, the whole it being some kind of AI or similar type of thing was pretty mind-blowing. Um, 
It's weird though. It it makes me think of a lot of these other poltergeist type things or bell witch like they compare it to and they behave like they are uh like they're independent but at the same time there's this weird kind of almost scripted thing like a interaction with a bot or something and the way it's just feeding on you uh-huh. know, it's like a something feeding on your google algorithm or something just feeding your shit back to you it's kind of yeah it's something similar not that it's i don't think it's exactly like an ai or something like that but I think that's the closest thing that we could possibly as a parallel, yeah. It's um, weird. See it as. Uh that was a very interesting speculation. And you know, with the whole Bell Witch story, I had always looked at that and you know, especially when I found out of this was about twelve years thirteen years ago that I found out about how the Bell Witch that that whole started because the Bell children had dug into this Indian mound. And, um, as you know, we've kind of been looking at this whole, well, you've really been looking at this whole Indian mound thing and how it's dotted all around the landscape here and, uh, how the city, a lot of these cities are built kind of on the remains of these Indian mounds. And, um, yeah, there's something possibly contained there of some kind of spiritual significance. I just found that extremely fascinating this whole idea and then like he was bringing up the whole thing about like they found a box and opened it and <laughs> so what is that <laughs> i do not know <laughs> i have some things to share from the book this is actually from the section of the book which is uh harry price's book that is they they reprinted in here that is called the haunting of cashin's gap it has a very nice picture of of jeff with his little bushy tail but this is some excerpts from the diary or actually the chronology rather that um harry price put in the book as an appendix which is all about everything that happened uh i'll read some of these Um, i think some of these are kind of funny kind of amusing um this is from 1933 July 26, Jeff, in high glee, sings three verses of El and Vanin, then two Spanish and one Welsh, Welsh verse, then says prayer in Hebrew and a sentence in Flemish. July 28, Jeff calls for food, whispering, Hey, Jim, what about some grubbo? I'm hungry. Mrs. Irving throws a couple of biscuits onto his sanctum, and Jeff is heard groping for them with his bony fingers. He takes a matchbox from Mrs. Irving, strikes a light, finds his biscuit, blows out match, and throws box back into the Irving's bedroom, afterwards giving a long chuckle. July 29th, four young ladies from Liverpool, three being school teachers and one a niece of Mrs. Irving, visit Dorlish Cashin. Jeff does not speak. Later in the day, he tells Irving, I have had a feed up on the three fields on the morn- on the mountain. I caught a young partridge. I will vomit it up if you give me some Ipec wine. August 6th, Jeff follows Irving to Peel and back, proving the fact to Irving by repeating the latter's conversation with various people. August 10th, Jeff offers to touch Irving's hand on the roof beam, but actually strikes it a hard blow with his quote-unquote fist subsequently laughs and clasps claps his hands in response to questions declares he has been in africa and has seen the sphinx and great pyramid does arithmetic sums propounded by mrs irving admits that for years i couldn't understand all that was said i tried to talk but couldn't until you taught me said he had seen vori on the pill bus seven times in a fortnight summer Jeff asks Irving if he has any enemies and offers to kill their lambs. Says, you don't know what mischief I could do if I was roused. I could kill you too if I wished, but I won't. October 25th. Jeff expresses dislike of Harry Price. He's the man who puts a kibosh on the spirits. In the course of the conversation, Jeff refers to the Gresford Colliery disaster, Einstein and Sir Isaac Newton, and says, I'll split the atom. He promises to give Irving an imprint of his hand. November 2nd, Jeff pushes about a chair weighing 12 pounds on his sanctum. He says, I am a freak. 
I have hands, and I have feet, and if you saw me, you'd faint, you'd be petrified, mummified, turned into stone or a pillar of salt, denies that he is a spirit. November 6, when asked what he will do for Captain McDonald if the latter visits Doorless Cashin, Jeff laughs for three or four minutes and declares, I have a pain in my side with my laughing. November 7th through 8th. Jeff, absent from home till the evening of the 8th, when he announces his return by calling out, If you knew what I know, you'd know a hell of a lot. November 10th, Jeff calls family at daybreak and in reply to Irving's question says, I am not a spirit, I am a little extra extra clever mongoose. November 19th, Jeff pushes about a heavy chair on his sanctum and indulges in satanic laughter. End of November. Jeff Profont promises to let Vori snap him on the garden hedge. About this time, an African spiritualist and her friend visit Dorlish Cashin. Jeff speaks and performs penny trick, but when asked to show himself, says, No damned fear, you'll put me in a bottle. Those are some of the uh, Jeff's sayings, sayings of Jeff the Talking Mongoose. <laughs> like he watched a lot of Jeopardy or something. Interesting stuff, man. It, it really has. It, it's it's so tri- so much so trivial. Yeah, anything. yeah. It's a it's a, it's a very trickster spirit kind of stuff. Um, one thing that I kind of wanted to leave the show tonight was an interesting story that has come up about this little boy in North in North Carolina. Eastern North Carolina. The one who hung out with the bears? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, it, here's the story. Did a bear help save boy missing for nearly three days? Family says three-year-old Casey Hathaway told them he was protected by a bear. A three-year-old North Carolina boy, Casey Hathaway, who disappeared for nearly three days before authorities found him last night, is said to be doing good as he recovers in the hospital. He's good. He's up and talking. He's already asked to watch Netflix, Casey's mom, Brittany, said during a Thursday night press conference. So he's good. He is good. According to ABC 11, family members said the boy indicated a bear became his new friend and helped him get through the days and nights while missing. Although it's unclear whether it's actually true or his imagination, loved ones are just relieved and happy the boy is alive and safe. As Crime Online previously reported, authorities found Casey tangled up in briars and thorn patches near Tollier and Aurora Roads, close to his grandmother's Craven County home, but not far from where he disappeared from on Tuesday afternoon while outside playing. He's been transported to the Carolina East Medical Center in New Bern for a medical evaluation. So they also said that uh, they there was a theory that uh, he may have been abducted and then returned, but they said that the, the authority said there's no indication of that. Is there anything back from medical yet, or is that all going to be probably private? Oh, I'm sure it'll probably be private. They think the kid's okay. So, uh, there's no, like, claw marks or anything. Yeah, so what to make of the bear thing? Well, everyone's saying Bigfoot, of course. Yeah, that's what everybody is saying. Yeah. I I, I don't know. I mean... That's probably what you would say if you're not aware of Bigfoot. It's, it, it, yeah, it's interesting because there's some of the cases in the uh, Missing 411 that talks about little children, uh, the ones that actually come back, um, saying that they were taken care of by a quote-unquote bear. That's happened more than once in those cases. Um, now, it was pointed out that black bears, which is what we have mainly in the eastern United States, yeah. are not very violent, and they're kind of docile, and that they pretty much eat, um, they're almost vegetarian just about. If they eat any kind of meat, it's probably small game. So it is could it have been possible that he might have been hanging out with an actual bear? But what would he I don't have, know. What would he have eaten? Right. Yeah. That's the thing. So, 
they would find out that he that something was feeding him, that would be a totally different thing. Because I don't think a bear would have the intelligence or the care to do something like that. I mean, I guess he could eat like salmon. Yeah. <laughs> like, there uh, you go. Here's some this sushi. I don't know what to think of that. It could maybe it's a, a you know maybe the kid was out there so long maybe the impossibility that he imagined it or it was a dream you know when you're that young can you distinguish a dream from reality. I don't know. I'm just looking for other possibilities here than just jumping to that it's Bigfoot. It's weird. I don't know if it's necessarily Bigfoot, but how? Yeah. What weirds me out is how how's this kid? How is he sustaining himself? I mean, even like getting the fresh water and everything else, like. Right. Good point. Because a three year old's really not going to know that. Yeah, and food. I mean. Right. Um. Nearly three days. Now, that's a long time for a small child to be out, out in the wilderness. So I don't know. Maybe Bigfoot took care of him. Maybe it was Mama Bigfoot. Mama Bigfoot. Yeah, something like that. So, <laughs> you may have noticed we are at Studio B. And I think we'll probably be at Studio B for the next few episodes. So, get comfortable. This is how it's going to be. Uh, we're gearing up for the 250th episode which we will be doing over at Rob's. Yes. So um, I want to thank Tim Swartz for coming on. Thank you, Serfiel, for recording tonight. And next time we're going to have on Mark O'Connell. Uh, we're going to talk about his book, The Close Encounters Man, which is all about the real J. Allen Hynek. And I have not seen the Project Blue Book, which we actually talked a little bit about that with Soraya last time. So I really have no idea anything about the uh, the series, whether it's more true to life or whether it's probably much more fictional. So I, I really don't know. Uh, have you seen it? No, I have not actually. Okay. Don't have the History Channel? No, no cable. Okay. Yeah, I've well, got to get Hulu or something. Yeah, no, nobody cares about cable anymore, really. Yeah, what's that? <laughs> the cable's on its way out alright guys well I think that's we're, we're gonna stop it there just uh, remember to um, watch out for Bigfoot and uh, watch out for bears maybe not maybe they're nice and take care of you for three days they might they, you know they might just take your children and just eat you but that's uh, that might be a whole, whole totally different thing so uh, guys we'll be back next time we'll see you in the next episode of Conspiranormal Conspiranormal